My name is Salome. Uh, I'm in my early 30s. I've been on a wheelchair for the last 21 years. I am paralyzed from here downwards. When I say paralyzed, that I can't feel from here downwards. I, due to spinal injury, I sustained 21 years ago when I fell in an abandoned quarry and I hit my back on a rock. So I was not born like this. I was working like everyone else until I was 13. My life took a drastic change. It's been a journey of tears, laughter, challenges, lessons, and here I am. It's not as bad as it looks. I'm even a mother of a little boy who is turning three years in a few months. When I was five, my mom moved with us to Kangemi to her parents' place, and that is basically where I was raised. So I've been in Nairobi since I was five years old. I was raised by my grandma because my mom died when I was 11, and my dad was not in our lives since I was five years old. Yes, he later died in the year 2007. But, but that's it, we didn't know him, we didn't have a rapport. He was just our biological father. When I was 13, my grandma sent me to Gilgil, to one of his son, for a few weeks before I could go to Form 1. You remember those times, before you reported to Form 1, you had to stay home for close to three months. So it was one of those three months. So I went there and I stayed with my uncle, that is sister to my mom, for a few weeks. Then one day, as I was coming um, to fetch water, I was carrying a 20 liters jerry can on my back and I was carrying two small ones on my boat, two arms. As I was coming down the hill, I don't know, I don't remember what I stepped on, but I stepped on something slimy and I, I, I rolled down to an abandoned quarry that had some, some water and some rocks. I landed on my back. I don't remember at what point the jerry can came off. I, I, can't, I can't quite recall what happened. It was so fast. Within a few seconds, I was down there. I was injured, but I landed on a rock, a big one this size, and I can tell you it broke. Yeah, I was just a tiny 13 year old, a typical one, but it broke. You can imagine the, the intensity of the fall or how hard I landed on it. I was there for, it took me a few seconds before realizing I fell. Probably I lost conscious, I don't know. I didn't feel any pain at all. I didn't feel any pain at all until some two gentlemen that were behind me, I heard them talk saying she's, she's fallen. They were trying to lift me and that's when the pain, that's when I started feeling the pain. They started lifting me, started helping me up and yeah, after a few minutes, I was able, to, they held me in on my both arms and I, we climbed up holding on. It was quite slight, it was raining. Like I said, it was raining, but we, we found ourselves up there and um, we went, they took me to, down to my, my uncle's place. They left and what I remember, I told my, my auntie, no, the wife to my uncle, I fell on a quarry. And I re her, um, her concern was, wasn't, why did I fall? How did I fall? Did I? And she was like, Kwapi Maj. Okay, I don't, I, don't know, I, I don't know why I remember that. I also was concerned with Kwapi Maj. I didn't know the, the impact of the fall at that moment. I went on doing my daily things every day for about 10 days. For about 10 days. But let me tell you, those day, oh, uh, let me just take you back. When I went there, I was sleeping on a very thin mattress that was laid on my maze cob. They hadn't been taken out of that. I was lying on that. That was my the makeshift bed. So it wasn't helping much. I've been hit. I sleep on, on something very rough. 
something that pokes on your back. The mattress is this thin. But at, at, when, I look at, when I look back at the story, it hits me what, what could have caused even more damage. It's not the fall, it's where I was lying and what did I do for those 10 days? I still went for water. I still carried loads on my back, you know. Uh, that bit is, is sad, that bit is sad that probably if I didn't continue doing this, maybe the damage would have been this intense. But it's water under the bridge, that's what I say. I tell myself that so that I can be sane and continue with life. So, in a nutshell, after 10 days, one day I woke up in the morning, I went for water, but tell you the truth, it took me more than an hour to get back home. I had to put it down, sit down, and I, would, I went home and told my, 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 my relatives about it, but they were not taking it seriously. You know, you can't blame them, the ignorance at that time, nobody, I didn't even know how serious it was, but around 10, my neighbor came, we had agreed that I would make her hair. She came, I wanted to make her hair so that I can get Basfia to come back home to my grandma because my the headache and the backache I was getting for those 10 days was unbearable. I wanted to come back home so that my grandma can take me to a hospital. There was no money to come back home, so I had to do some, whatever I needed to do. So I, I had talked to that girl, she comes today, I make her hair, she gives me money, I go back to Nairobi. As I was making a hair, I could not sit down. I told her, me, for the last 10 days, I can't sit down. I can either lie flat on my back or stand. I can't fold my back. So I, was, I, I made her hair halfway, and then I told her, I feel funny. My feet feel funny. I feel like I'm stepping on sponge, even when I'm stepping on this rough concrete. I feel like I'm stepping on sponge or very soft grass. And they were heavy from my feet up to my knee. They were heavy. They felt funny. I even laughed about it. And I told her, and she, she laughed about it. Then I told her, I have a headache. Why can't we go to your place? Because there are trees and there are shades. We try, I try finish there so that I can come and park. So we went to her place. She left me seated on a, not a chair. A, it's, it doesn't have the big, bigger cushion, but it's like a couch. The, those time couches. I sat on that couch and I spread out waiting for the, for the tea so that we can continue. That was around 3, 3 p.m. I slept there. She came back after 15 minutes. She, now she put down, I was to sit down. I tried sitting down, I could not. I, the way I, I was like, I was a zo like a zombie. I lied there, stretched out. I could not move apart from my arms and my head. And I told her, my whole body feels like I have thousands and thousands of needles poking me from all angles. It felt like that. She would touch me and I would scream on top of my voice. And she, she started laughing. She thought I'm joking. She said, I'm not joking. I can't stand. I can't even move. I'm saying that is 3 p.m. So we sat there. I could, we were just sat there talking. She waited for her mom. Her mom told me, hey, you need to go home. Stuck in Manena with your uncle. I said, you just go and call him. I can't get out of this place. And that is, that is, that is true. Everybody came. It was, it was dramatic. I was there lying. I'm talking. Nobody, I don't look, in, I don't look sick anywhere. But then I can't move. I can't move. I can't even feel. I can't even tell where my leg is. I can't even tell where my, my tummy is. I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel... If you touched me, I didn't feel. If you, if you poked me, I didn't feel. I didn't feel cold. I didn't feel hot. So my uncle told me, Ebu, stop joking. We need to go home. I told my uncle, me, I can't. I don't even feel where my legs is. He touched me. Where have you touched you? I touched you? I said, I don't know. And then I would laugh about it because it sounded funny. I mean, he didn't, I, didn't, I, I really didn't, I didn't know what was going on. He carried me on his back, the way you can carry a baby on his back. I might have weighed maybe 40 kg, so it wasn't, a, it, wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. He took me home, and you guess what? Guess where he went and laid me? The same bed of a thin mattress on top of maize cob. I was there for about 48 hours. Mamas from the village would come uh, this gives you this painkiller, another one gives you this. It is even God I didn't get 
overdosed. I took so much. Everything everyone thought would work. There was no means for, for transport on the next uh, nearest clinic. Do you know what they did? They made a makeshift uh, stretcher made of <clears throat> brown woolen sacks. Those ones that used to, to, to pack uh, potatoes. They, they made uh, two huge sticks, two huge sticks, and another huge. And so I laid there. So four men, four men carried me down the hill, and it's a big hike. It's a big hill. It took them close to three hours to get down. And they would go bump me again. Then I scream on top of my voice because of the pain. And they put me down. Again, I'm not sure if it was today, it would be all over the news because of the chaos, <laughs> the drama. Then when I went there, when I went to the clinic, uh, the medical officer we found there did some, you know, preliminary diagnosis, touch me here, what happened. I had not gone to the washroom for all, since, for like close to two days. My bladder was full. He said, you have to rush her to, to Nakuru Provincial Hospital. By then it was called that. And there was no means. See, I told you I came downhill with water. There's no way I'm going to reach to Nakuru now in a makeshift stretcher. Lucky enough, there was a priest going to Nakuru with a pickup, single cabin pickup. So I was to go with my uncle and his friend. Everyone else go, get, went back to the village. I was taken with that, uh, by that pickup to Nakuru. I laid on that pickup. It is so rough. It's so rough. The pickup is so rough on the back. I laid down. The only thing that was, uh, that was supporting my back was a piece of um, a cloth. There wasn't any, we didn't even know what was going on. Additional injury to my back, falling, sleeping on maize cob, carrying loads on my back, and now I'm on a pickup that is bumpy. I went to the hospital, and I went to the hospital, the first thing they did is help me, is help um, with my, my bladder was full. I think another minute would have exploded or something, I don't know. I was in that hospital for 11 days before I was transferred to KNH. This is someone who can feel from their waist down. They're saying they fell. Definitely they know this is paralysis that has resulted from spine injury, but they cannot tell you that. First of all, when you say you have paralysis from spine injury, I don't understand what is that. So they, they kept me there for 11 days, and apart from painkillers, I don't remember. I don't remember much. I don't remember much. I don't remember x-rays. You know, those tools for diagnosis, I don't remember. We used to sleep in a tiny bed with two people. I have a spine injury. I can't turn myself. And I can't even remember there's someone who died when I in the same bed. Yes, at 13. Some, hey, someone died in the same bed. You call them, wanna check her? Come and take, you can ask, yeah, let me just wait. It's, it's amazing that I didn't lose my mind. Yeah, so I was taken to diagnosis and x-rays and MRI to try and find out what happened took place in KNH. That is like six weeks later. Because when I came to KNH, I didn't stay in casualty like people say. First of all, I was young. Secondly, I think the injury was quite eminent. Everyone could tell I'm really injured. So I went straight to the wards and... We, uh, my grandma needed to raise quite a hell of money for, for MRI, for the CT scan. And it took a long, long, long time before we could raise 25,000 shillings. 25,000 shillings 20 years ago. Oh my God. Okay. Really? That was a lot. That was a lot for people who, who didn't even... It's another st okay, that's another story. My mom died when I was 11. That is two years before I got injured. We were three of us. I was the firstborn. I have a sister and then I have a brother. We are two, two years older than the other. I'm two years older than my sister. She's two years older than my brother. We started living with my grandma immediately after my mom died. And uh, she had nine children, my mom being the firstborn. When we started living with her, we got to be how many kids? Three plus nine, mm. 11, 11 minus one, 10, 10 plus. There's another auntie of ours that had died early and left a girl. 
So we were a huge family. The, the, the burden was too much for my grandpa. He couldn't take it anymore. And he walked out on us and he left and he went and rented some other place. It was my grandma who had never gone to school, had no means of making a living. It was, our childhood was horrible. It was bad. Maybe worse than my injury, it was really bad. It's not one day that we've gone to sleep hungry. It's not one day that at 12 I would go wash people's clothes, people's houses so that we can have. And they will not even pay me. They'll give me a packet of unga, 2 kg. Jogo. Ayaki people. Aish. Yeah. It was, it was terrible. And now you expect a lady in her 50s who has no means of transport, hata kuna anyone to fully and go for, to raise 25,000 shillings. First of all, even transport will come and see me in the hospital. Hakuna, they used to come once a month. And they'd, they would walk from Kangemi to another place, then take a matatu that will pay 10 shillings so that they can, they can come to the hospital. It was a lot of money. In fact, she didn't even raise it. Some sisters from our parish had to raise that. Otherwise, I would not have done that. MRI, where would she get 25,000 shillings? It's absurd. She wouldn't have found that. Well, eventually we did the MRI and the, the doctor found out that I had a spine injury at my thorax. We call it T6. T6 is quite high. Doctor still didn't understand how my arm still worked. I still had full function of my arms. Was that way? That is quite high. It's at my breast level. Um, but who is God? We can't explain everything. I was in hospital for a long time, mostly for physiotherapy, and mostly for yeah, mostly for physiotherapy. And I would ask, when am I ever going to walk? You know, I thought it's like Marelia. You take medication, and then after two weeks you walk. Actually, let me just say, nobody told me exactly what was going on. Nobody bothered to tell me that I have an injury that is permanent. They just said, you have a spinal injury at certain level. And I would ask, and then how long will it take before I can walk again? He said, hmm, it takes time. You are never injured. It, they usually takes a long time. I said, a long time is what time? He said, we don't know also, we, we, we learn on the job. And actually, nobody told me I will never walk again. I found out by default, I haven't walked for the last 21 years, so that's it. That's how I knew that. That was serious. That was serious. At 13, most of things don't make sense. Neither did that. So I was in, I was in KNH for about 23 months. Not one year, close to, but 23 months. I went home on 23rd month. And I was discharged after a year and a few months. Someone would ask, then why were you in the hospital for that long? There was a huge bill. Secondly, I could not go home without a wheelchair. Where would I get a wheelchair from? So that's why it took so long for me in KNH. Not because I needed to be in hospital for 23 months. There was nothing they were doing there. I was just, just a bed in physiotherapy, which was important. But physiotherapy can always get it somewhere else. You have to be admitted in the hospital. Eventually, the nuns that had paid for MRI, you remember I told you there are some nuns that came forth and paid for an MRI for me from our parish, are the same people that bought a wheelchair. But for the bill, which I don't remember how much it was, I don't know. I think at that time, I can't know how much it was. Eh? The hospital waived it. It was either they keep me there and they look for a way of how they can get money from me being there or they let me go. So they let me go. And I was even taken home by the hospital's van. That that's how bad it was. With a wheelchair that I'd been bought by the nuns from my parish. That's how my two years of falling in a quarry, going to the hospital, being diagnosed, was sitting on a wheelchair, going home, wrapped. Being injured in the hospital is not the biggest story. It's what came after. That's, that's the story. I came to home and uh, rea what had happened sunk. I realized what's going on. If I was to walk, this is, this is my thinking, if I was to walk, 
the hospital would have held me there until I walked and discharged me, go home, continue with my life. So probably this is my life now. And um, what do I do with it? It took me four years to figure that out. Yeah, it took me four years to figure that out. I was 13, now I'm 17. Four years. Let me just take you back a bit so that it makes sense. I, when I went home, everyone else, or my siblings were in school. They were all in primary school. Some were in lower primary, others were in upper primary. And my grandma would have to go every day out to look for, for food. So I would be left at home alone. We didn't have electricity, we didn't have a radio, we didn't have, um, we didn't have any means of communication to the outside world. So there was this one-seater uh, sofa on the another one. Would will will bring them together. I sit on the other and I stretch out my leg on on the other. And that was my seat for two years every single day, apart from Saturday and Sunday when my siblings are home or Sunday mostly when Saturday mostly because they would be home cleaning uniform, doing house chores, homework. But on Sunday they would go to church. So Sunday I would only see them in the evening. For six days in a week, I was so lonely. I've never felt so lonely in my life like I felt when I sat on those sofas. I would contemplate suicide, but then I can't walk. I can't get myself out of the couch to my wheelchair to go look for something to commit suicide on. I really thought, I really think if I got hold of something, I wouldn't be here today. So when people talk about suicide, it's not a joke. It's there. People do kill themselves. And it's so easy. It's so, so easy. It's just that, that moment of no hope. I would look, I'm, I'm, look at, I'm 15, I'm 14. I'm not, I'm not of any use to my grandma. I'm not of any use to my sister and my brother. Instead, I'm a burden. Instead, you know, I can't go to a washroom by myself. I can't, what am I really? I really think, what, who am I? What am I? What do I, what do I present, represent in this family? It's already hard hit. They don't need this. My siblings don't need this. They would be better off without me. Probably life would be a bit easier physically and even emotionally for everybody. That was my thinking then. But then, as much as you think of suicide and how, and how of low value you are, you, your mentor also sharpens. You have time to think. Lots and lots of it. You have time to think if life was different, what would you do? You also have time to figure out who you are. Let me tell you, when people go for retreats, it's not, it's not in vain. It really helps. So I was in retreat for all those years. And I really knew what I wanted. When, when suicide wasn't an option anymore, because I thought if I killed myself, it would be traumatized my, my sister and my brother. And probably also my grandma. She would think she didn't do much. So there was also that part. And then I was lucky enough. Huh? The sisters that were the bought wheelchair and also the, did, they paid for MRI started visiting me every Thursday for a mass. Well, I'm Catholic, so they would come do mass for, short mass for about an hour. And then something else, they would come with food. They would bring unga. One brought unga, the other one's curry, and I'm in Guinea, a bow soup every Thursday. It was something to look forward to, trust me, apart from the prayers. But that was, that was something we looked forward to every day. Every Thursday we knew we'd get food. It continued for three years. Then the third year, they started buying thread for me. I would make Vitamba and give them the sell. I'm very sure they didn't sell any. They were just keeping them in the shelf and giving me money so that I feel useful. I'm sure they didn't sell nothing. It was, you see, I was busy. Even if I was seated there, I was busy and I was making little money for the family. And it got to a point I could not knit anymore. I mean, could I, I, I was not knitting forever. So I started telling them, like, sister, me, I wish I can just go to school. And you know, one sister told me, so let me understand, but it's not everything we want in life we get. She told me that. I said, yeah, true. But I nagged. I nagged. Every Thursday. Every Thursday, I would say that. Every Thursday, I would say that. As a person, I really valued school, and I really thought that 
education and career would be the only thing that would rescue us from this poverty. Ours was impoverished family, right from age, from lineage and lineage and lineage and lineage and lineage. It was bad. I didn't want it. I wanted something different. And now here I am, I'm injured. But I really, you know, as a person, in my subconscious, I still knew what was good for me. What was good for me is going to school. What was good for me is enlightening myself, knowing something different. Knowing that people don't get married when they're 13. Knowing, you know, I wanted, I wanted to be someone who'd make a difference, if not for me, for someone else. And before I got injured, I told you I had gone to my, to my uncle, waiting to go to school. I had got an admission in Pangani Girls. Unfortunately, that didn't happen because I got injured. But still, you remember those days if you were going to Pangani Girls? Eh? It wasn't a joke. It meant, it meant something. It meant good grades. Yeah, and my mom had just died like two years before I did my KCP and I was still able to get these good grades. But here I am, I'm not, I'm not going to Pangani Girls, but I'm very sure something can happen. I wasn't sure what. Trust you me, even basic life maintenance, I could not. I could not take myself to bed. I could not clean myself. Let me tell you, people just see wheelchairs and people on wheelchairs. The inside stories, those are the stories that cannot be told, but they are there, they exist. You lose function of everything that we When we say, have injury from here. Just know everything down there is affected. Going to the washroom, emptying your bladder, emptying your bowels, walking. Those are the things people don't talk about. But I wish people could talk about them because those are, those are the disability aspect of not being able to walk. It's so, it, 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 it takes away your social life. It takes away your love life, family. You know, those are... Not walking is overrated, let me tell you, because I can move from one point to another using a wheelchair. But there's some other things that people don't talk about that human beings need to be sensitized about. Not to lose track, let's go back to the sister. Sister could not take me to school. She did not have the finances. She didn't have the, well, the necessary. I needed a lot. I needed assistant. I needed money. She didn't have that. So what sister did, sister took me to a children's home so that maybe I can get out of that, that environment. Let, them, let my sisters and my brother and my, my shosho breathe. I'm not saying they were, trying to get, they, they, want, they were trying to get rid of me, no. But they needed some space so that I can even figure out what to do. So if I can get someone else to take care of me, my grandpa would even worry less. My grandma would worry less. I went, sister took me to a children's home of uh, kids who lived with disability in Langata. <laughs> I thought I was going to school. <laughs> well, they see my name, everything. Yeah? When I went there, this is the third year. When I went there, my sisters left me there and they, it was a sister's place. It was another Catholic affiliated home. The other sister told the sister that brought me, uh, let her stay for a month. If she doesn't like it, she'll go back home. As if I had a choice. So I was there and sisters were staying with me to see whether I would like it or not. There was food, there was shelter. Well, I missed my, my family, but it was a better option. Um, I stayed in with sisters in Langata for about a year and a half. Then as they were taking their, one of their kids to school, they realized I would be left there again alone. So there wouldn't be any difference of taking me from home there. What's the point of taking me from home? Come make, uh, keep me here, doing nothing, staying in one spot, for, for 12 hours, there was no point. So as they were, they were looking for school for other kids, they also looked for me. And uh, lucky enough, I didn't go to any special school. I was taken to a normal boarding school, a normal high school boarding school. And I think I was the only one with a disability there. Yes, I was the only one. I'm telling you, I was so nervous. It was so confusing. I didn't know what I'll do with myself. 
sisters went, paid school fees, provided whatever I needed, and then they left. Figure it out, which is exactly what I needed. For our first two weeks was tough. The high school life was new to me. The situation was also new to everyone else. We were new to each other. They didn't know whether if they asked to help me, it will offend me. If they don't help me, whether it will, I'll be offended. Everyone else was confused from the teachers to my fellow students. It was really hard. But I would wake up in the morning and other people in the dormitory, they would ask, do you need help? And you know, come on, Imjanja, when Imjanja too. I had really developed really a uh, really good positive attitude. If I needed help, I would say I need help. And the first few days, I even remember there's a time I didn't go to school. I didn't go to class. Because Kilamtu got ready late, they left. I didn't know how to say Musimiache. Yeah, I was left. And it's the principal. He had a really interesting principal who was. <laughs> He didn't parade to us, where is that girl on a wheelchair? So they had to come back for me. Uh, it was bad, I felt bad, but then I shook it off and I went to class because I knew what I wanted. What I wanted was bigger than humiliation of one day. And after all, I will not need to know these people for the next four years. And probably if I go to class and I would shun them, they'll forget they left me in the dormitories. So I still have the same head, just that the environment has shaken me a bit, but it's still the same girl. That school was a mixture of boys and girls. I think that was a turning point and it was really helpful. Physically, boys would push me in my wheelchair and then the attention I got was really, you know, it changed my mind. <laughs> I mean, it was really a, t a turning point. High school was really a turning point for me. I forgot, it's, it's hard to forget, but I, f I didn't focus so much on my disability. I focus on what can I do with my disability? How can I change the mind of my friends? How can I make them see it's not, it's not the end of life? And it's in high school that I realized what I wanted to do in life, how I wanted to change other people's life. I didn't know how, I didn't know what path to take, but all I, know, I, want, all I knew is that I want to change how people look at other people living with disability, especially this type of disability, being paralyzed and being confined on a wheelchair. Those four years, I think they are the happiest of my life than our school life. Because um, I really worked hard in school because I needed it. I needed to put something extra on the table so that my voice can be heard. I also worked hard so that I didn't want sympathy. I know sympathy would have destroyed me. So working hard was also to eradicate sympathy, to get me where I want to go, and also to prove to myself that all is not lost. Being able to, to school with kids that are not disabled, that are so different from me, was an eye-opener. I realized that in most cases, and people will prove me wrong, people tend to treat you the way you show them they should treat you. You get back what you give. If you give them bad attitude, bad mentality, self-sympathy, that is what you're going to get in return. And I realized I don't need that. So how I dealt with my friends and my classmates, there was no difference. If I didn't do any homework, my teachers would treat me just like, I will be beaten like everyone else. If I got late, I would be beaten by, like anyone else. I needed to be in class by a certain time. So it was, my, it was my problem how I got there. So if I woke up earlier than everyone else, it's okay, you know, life, in life with Tutoshani, so some of us have to work harder than the others so that we can reach to a certain point. I realized that I was never, I was never treated differently by my friends and my teachers because I didn't work like them. No, 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 I wasn't. I wasn't favored because I didn't work like the others. Nope. And I also didn't expect favors. If it's studying, I had to study hard. 
I mean, when I would do my KCSE, I, I knew my paper won't be drawn a wheelchair there, so they wouldn't know it's me. They wouldn't know this is a disabled person, so you have to be lenient. No. And if I needed certain grades to do certain courses, I needed to work hard. I needed, I, I understood that, and I was so free with everyone else. We, I would, I would go lie on, I would go sit on a, on a bench in a field, and then uh, girls and boys would take my wheelchair and go with it. They realize it's just a chair. There is no stigma in it. I was so proud to impact that in those students. I was so proud to impact that in my friends. I'm very sure if they went and met other people on a wheelchair or disabled differently, they would look at them some people who, who are just different, someone who is different. I don't walk like you. I, will, I, I push my chair from one point to another. There is no much difference. The difference is brought about by obstacles that we find in our environments. If I come to your house, you live in that flow, there is no means of... That is when you, I realize my disability. But if those obstacles in life are not there, or when, I, when I'm looking for work, and I have the merits and you discriminate me against my dis uh, based on my disability, that is when you, the, e the, the, the effect of disability sinks in. And um, you know those two story to our boyfriends, girlfriend in high school, I was still in the mix. It was really, it really opened my eye. Kumbe, it, <laughs> Kumbe it's, all, is, all is not lost. Kumbe, I'm still, I'm still a person like any other person. I wanted to do law. I really saw myself as a lawyer, someone who, who articulate other people's issues. But remember what sister told me in the year 2003, you don't always get what you want. So I didn't get to be a lawyer, but I got to be something else. I, I went to Catholic University. I studied and I, I did finance for four years. Hey, that was tough. Not the studies. It was tough. It was tough. Financially, it was tough. It's still a miracle how I, how I managed to do that course and finish, how I graduated. We did like, my family did like 20 harambees. They can't keep track. We do a harambee targeting to get 200,000. We get 60K and we use 20K to kukupika. Oh God, it was so tough. It was so hard. Let me tell you the hardest part of being in university. And probably people don't talk about this because it's not beautiful, it's not nice. It is the truth. I told you when you have a spinal injury, not being able to walk is the least of your problems. I told you there's other problems like bladder and bowel management. It's, all, it's not everyone, most of people do regain that function, but no, it's not everyone that regain that function, let's tell you. And that, that's the hardest part of being disabled like I am. I had lost that fun, those function like everybody else, and I told you my injury was quite high, so it's obvious. I had a challenge with that. Um, I lived far off the campus, because the campus is mainly occupied by religious people, priests, uh, Catholic nuns, and Catholic brothers. They are meant for that. So I lived off. I needed to take a vehicle from home, or from where I had rented, to school every day. Every day I had a class. And I used to use, to wear, to, I used to use adult diapers. Adult diapers, how much was a packet? About 3,000 shillings. A packet had, had, how many did it have? It had 30, had 30 pieces. So, because that 3,000 shilling is a lot of money, I used to live on handouts from well-wishers. You know, there are so many priests, some of them are foreigners, they had lots of money. So I would, I would befriend one, maybe one would give me 5,000 shillings. 5,000 shillings would take me a long way. And then there's a priest who would pay a taxi on monthly basis for me. So there's a priest who paid monthly taxi fee, uh, expense for me. There's someone else who feeds me. There's someone else who pays rent. And if they pay today, that doesn't mean they're going to pay next month. So life was not consistent. I didn't know whether I'll be in class tomorrow. I don't have diapers. Because I have 30 pieces. I have to keep to make sure I'm to me, 
tomorrow one so that it can take me 30 days. I'm an adult. So sometimes, okay, probably people who are like me are saying, well, you need to it's the truth. Eh? It's how it is. I would use one diaper, go to class from, I have, I have five classes, each class is three hours from morning to evening. I would get wet. Urine flows down. I used to nikwa naka palembele. Cause nikika nyuma stawa na swingi niwa refu nani and then I want to hear and then I know why what I imagine I'm suffering all this much and then I don't get anything. So I used to stay palembele. So it hit me fast. <laughs> so nikwa naka palembele and then if you get just get inside that room, I'm at that big hall. You can just smell the urine right from from the from entrance. Kai, me that didn't, it bothered me, but nearly block. I only smell for four years. That was my drive. I will only smell for this much. I will only smell for this. Sometimes it, my diaper would be full in a leak, in a flow back of lecturer. He looks at it, hey, and the I mean, will he stop? Will he start mopping the, the room? So they were used to it. I got embarrassed. Embarrassment ika kwa sasiki too. And then I had three, three friends who stuck with me, whether I'm smelling or not. A friend of mine, two girls and one boy. This boy knew everything. I mean, oh God, God bless him. I mean, it, you, I had to toughen my skin. I had, things had to hit me and bounce back from wherever they came from. Because... If that's, that stigma and that embarrassment got in my way, I would not be where I am today. I would still be smelly. But now I knew I would just smell for, for a few years, probably a few months, and then probably if I wouldn't have gotten back my bladder function, probably I'll be able to buy myself more diapers. See, that's my focus. That was my focus then. And yeah, whether urine or not, I was able to graduate. It was that. Ah, let me tell you something. Yeah, this one I have to say. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you. See, I was being carried by different taxis every day in Anichuko and Rudisha. Nena nakali a taxi amtu. Na isoel. After I did see Bure, nena home. Ana nembea kitukesha na mpigia na nembea. Gai, niko dhika. Siyezi kuja, siju hini. So I'll get a new one. Mwenye ajui story yangu. So hata nibeba one week and then I, something like that happened. It should go to a point. <laughs> it go to a point. <laughs> no taxi wanted to carry me. No taxi wanted to, to take me to school. Hakuna, whether I'm paying much, whether I'm paying expensive or not, whether Hakuna Okay, it's fine. It's not <laughs> I know it's not funny, but when I look at it from this angle, it's funny. And I knew one day, one day I would sit up on a taxi classic every day forever. So I just had to suffer for a few, get just get embarrassed for a few months or a few years. Things would get better. I was so hopeful. I was so hopeful. The taxi and the and the urine in the classroom. I, I, I. Let me tell you, if you're in, if you're not insane, if you have a sound mind, that's tough. That stuff. I got. I graduated in 2012, but I had finished my course a year earlier, and then I started write. I started doing. People, would, I think people call them writing jobs. I would work online all night, writing assignment for other for other lazy people. Yeah, if they, if we were well, we would. Per page is this much. But if you get a good grade, you give me this much. They always got a good grade. So after school, people that were supporting me, they stopped supporting me anymore. I'm not a student, of course, it makes sense. And I moved to Kino. I used to live in Karen, now I moved to Kino. I don't have a job, I've not graduated, but now I can buy myself diapers. If I can pay my, my, my rent, then I could buy myself diapers from writing jobs. I think I used to work for more than 19 hours and I sleep for those few hours. I worked so hard. I worked so hard that 
the first few months I was out of school, I was able to support my grandma. I was not employed by anyone. I was paying my rent. My cabbage sit uko 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 kino. I bought myself as many diapers as I wanted, all the brands that I felt like. I, yeah. Hmm. I had a school fees balance of about 40K. I think I cleared it in a month. Kai. See, I was so proud of myself those few months. Um, and then I didn't get a job. And then writing jobs, they were so stressful. I think I stopped them at some point. And I had never, I had never, ever, ever gone to a rehab. Ideally, when you get spine injury after medication, after treatment, you need to go for rehab. I didn't go for any rehab. At, after graduation, I thought I should go for rehab. <laughs> that was 13 years down the line. I thought but probably I'd go and find out what happens there. I took myself to Spinal Cold Injury Hospital. I explained to them what had happened to me. Transfers are so difficult. When I say transfer, transfer is from my wheelchair to any other surface, to bed, to a chair, to a car. I needed to learn those because I needed them. It was so difficult. The only place I could take myself without help was the bed. And it was still a struggle. Um, I went to spine injury and they said, you need an, in you need an intense program. Do you think you can be coming every day? I told them I can't, I can't afford coming every day. And I, I had an HIF functional that was helpful. It paid for that. I was admitted in the hospital for four months. And then I was called for an interview when I was still there because I was playing. I carried my computer there. So uh, my first interview, my first interview, I changed from hospital clothes, home clothes to go for interview. And then after interview, I came back to the hospital. But that, that, that was just for rehab, Ph intense physiotherapy, occupation therapy, learning how to do things that I didn't know I would do with myself. Mm. It's there that I was able to get an upright posture. I could sit in any service without any, any support on my back. Imagine for those, all those 13, 14 years, I could not support my back. Yeah, even in high school, I could not support my back. Um, it was those four months, and then after the fourth month, I think I got a job. So they had to discharge me to go and work. I really wanted to be a mom, because I, for myself, I'm sorry, I wanted to be a mom for myself. I wanted to, if I, it was, it was, it was, come on, I would really want to have had five kids. Um, Every year I would say, next year I'm getting pregnant. Next year I'm getting pregnant. I have to get. Then next year comes as Jamal Shule. I went back to school. Eh? I went back to school. I did a high diploma. Then I went back to school for masters. So every time I say, Jamal Shule, Jamal Shule, Jamal Shule. When I do that, when I finish this project, and then I got, and then I, I was that. <laughs> hey, and I was like, Kai, when will ever get a child? And then I was, uh, I was telling my sister, whoever will be in my life at that time, <laughs> Hara Bahati. Actually, I wanted to get pregnant, seriously. I even went to the hospital. I had a guy now who thought I was crazy because he was asking, well, what makes you think you can't just get, I, I, I told him, I, just, I want to find out whether everything is okay. Everything, everything biologically with me is okay. And he said, I can, we can do tests and find out whether it's okay, but it was expensive. Um, I was in the process of doing the tests and trying. And then I think two months then the, the line I got pregnant. I think I got pregnant when I, when I was ready to get pregnant. Yes, so um, when I was seven weeks pregnant, seven weeks pregnant, I got a blood clot in my lungs. Yes. Um, I, I felt ill quite fast and I went to the hospital equally fast because I think after a few hours I was in the hospital and I was lucky enough I found a very informed 
cardiologist who didn't wait to do the tests. First of all, when you're pregnant, there are so many CT scans and so many diagnostic uh, machines you can be put in. But when I explained what I was feeling, I was short of breath. I was passing out. My leg was swollen. My heart rate was so high. My heart rate was 245 instead of 90. So he just figured out, and then I, he knew I was paralyzed. I don't walk. The sitting down for long tends to make your, the circulation to your, to your legs is not so good. And uh, I started blood, I started taking blood thinners from there henceforth. I was in hospital for three days, um, taking injections, and then I was discharged. I could not do oral. I could not do oral medications because I was pregnant. So the tough Salome, I went home with injections. So I used to inject myself twice a day, morning and evening, morning and evening. This is how determinant I was to carry the baby because also uh, uh, eliminating the pregnancy was, a, was another option medically. Yeah? I couldn't take that. I asked, if I inject myself, will I carry the baby two times? Yeah, will he have any deformities? No. But if you took uh, oral medication, probably. So, so if I inject myself, it will be okay. Yeah. So I injected myself for, 12, for the whole term. And my child came at, not eight, he wasn't eight months yet. Um, I don't know why. I couldn't carry him anymore. I couldn't. My, my life, all, I mean, I couldn't move. He was too big. So, and because he was tam, we just opted for an electric CS. So I got a baby. My baby was very shy of 4 kg at seven months. Um, having a child has really, ch well, when you get a child, nothing is the same anymore. Nothing, nothing, nothing is the same anymore. First of all, for me, I was not lonely anymore. I was work. I, I had a reason to even work more harder. Apart from proving myself that I'm of value, and a great value, I'm also taking care of someone else. My, the injury or the spine injury. In as much as it happened, did not take out Salome. It just took out my ability to walk, my ability to stand out and and maybe put off a light. The ability to do things that need to be done when you're in your upright posture. But everything else I'm able to do, I, I'm able to look at that child, instill discipline in him. I'm able to look at that child, feed him. If he's sick, um, I'm, I'm worried like any other mother. I'm able to provide. I usually say, I don't want my child to ever say, I missed this because my mom was disabled. No. Okay, maybe it's a stupid mentality, but I can't help it. I want my child to get the best. I do not want him to feel any less privileged because he was given birth by me. No, 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 no. So that's my focus every day. That's my goal every day. I want my child to be, I want to be, I want wherever he will be, he makes an impact. I believe I've made an impact to maybe my friends and my siblings. I want him to make a bigger one. I was raised by this mama that didn't have this much, was not able to do this much, but I still got something out of myself. So, and I, then I look forward every day to go home, to go be with him. Parents, caregivers, and people with disability view disability. I wanted to change how a mother who has a disabled child look at it. There is no reason to hide your child because they can't walk or they don't look like their siblings. No. There's, 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 these are purpose for that child that God has meant for. Also, my passion is with people who are newly injured, people who have newly acquired spinal cord injury. It's not end of life. It's, it, it's, it's a total, it's a 360 turn, turn, turn around, but it's not end of life. You can be whatever you wanted to be. If you wanted to be a mother, you can be. If you wanted to be a husband, you can be. If you wanted to be a, a wife, you can still be. You just have to do it differently. And I've, um, I've, uh, I have a YouTube, a YouTube channel called Salome Robin where I show people 
how I do my everyday life, how a typical day is. How do I get off bed? How do I look after Robin? How do I take Robin to school? How do I go to work? How do I interact with people? If I go to a shopping mall and I'm alone, how do I get out of my car? How am I able to ask for help? How am I able to shop alone? Basically, I teach them how to ask for help, how to smile through all the challenges, how to still find humor in it. There are other stories that people don't know about. How challenging it is, especially for a person living in Kenya, and you need to earn a living. For example, let's say I'm looking for a job in town. I live in Kangemi. I need to border a matatu. Do you know how difficult it is? Even the fact that some of those matatus are not willing to, to carry you. And those that are willing to carry you, you will pay for three seats. My seat, my wheelchair will go to two seats. I reach to town. When I go to town, whoever is, in, whoever is running uh, the interviews will segregate me. When you know the stereotype that I have a disability, I may not be, be as productive as the other. Or they'll have to adjust and it's financially costing for them to adjust to accommodate me. You don't give me a job. I need to go back home. I don't even have money to go back to home. You don't give me a job. It becomes 10 times harder for a Kenyan living with disability. And you know, most of Kenyans, we come from humble background like myself. So when government institution deny people with disability opportunities, they need to understand how many lives they are destroying how many lives they are ruining. I want to show that in action. Go and look it up and please subscribe, don't forget. Salome Robin, yes. Come and take me through this journey. Let's teach Kenyans together.